So now in the topic of community ecology, let's talk about what makes species rare, what makes some dominant, and the effects of invasive species on diversity. Dominant species are those that are found to cover a lot of ground in a community or have a great influence and they certainly affect the general aspect of the plant community. Why are they dominant? It might be because they appeared first and it has to do with the history of colonization of a certain community. It might be that depending on the successional phase some dominate, dominate then recede in a later stage and perhaps in each phase, the dominant species is competitively, competitively superior to others. And this has been investigated, as we've learned, looking at competition between species in um, greenhouse and plantation experiments, but probably most effectively in the field with removal experiments. A wonderful plant ecologist who died long before her time, Deborah Rabinowitz, came up with this scheme, still widely used today, to describe eight categories of commonness and rarity based on three traits, their geographic range, habitat specificity, and local abundance. In this table, we can see that species with a wide geographic range, broad habitat specificity, we would expect always to be common, except if their local abundance was everywhere small, then they would just be sparse. And at the other extreme, species that have a narrow geographic range, restricted habitat specificity, and large local abundances would be expected to be endemic, but those that have small local abundances would be rare from all things. This emergent tree out of the canopy of the tropical rainforest may be pretty infrequent and therefore rare. And here in this table from our book, we can see the percentages of species falling into each of the eight commonness and rarity categories in three studies. If we look down to the tropical rainforest first, it actually turns out that there are very few rare species in a tropical forest. Rather, what we have is species with a wide geographic range and restricted habitat specificity. So those are the things that might appear rare, but they're actually just not too abundant locally. We can contrast this with vascular plants of the British Isles, where there are quite a few rarer species, and the montane wet meadows in Spain with higher species richness, the number of rare species is greater. So, although it's not a very tight correlation, the greater the range of a species, the greater its local abundance tends to be. We can see an exception to this is Mentha cervina with a very restricted range and high local abundance. So for most plant species with limited range, what limits their range is the kind of soil they grow on as well as the edaphic conditions moisture and um, specifically minerals or chemicals available in the soil to them. Plants that don't disperse well also tend to be restricted in range and then there's just historical chance why something ends up where. Following the unified neutral theory of biodiversity of Steve Hubble that we talked about earlier. This is a picture of perhaps the world's rarest tree, the Wallamai pine, found in an isolated canyon in Australia just about 10 years ago. And conservationists are taking great measures to protect it in its isolation from disease, etc. 
and we have a little video to watch on the website about this. So if we rank species from those that are the most common on the left of the x-axis to those that are the least common, ranking species in order of their commonness, and then look at their relative abundance on the y-axis, it always is a decreasing function. The theoretical distributions predicted by the broken stick model in A decreases with a bump. The geometric series, B, straight line, and the log normal distribution, a little less of an abrupt straight line with a slight curve in it. We can look at actual data from two studies, the subalpine fir forest, which tends to follow the geometric series, that tends to appears to very well. These two are quite similar. And the deciduous cove forest in the southeastern U.S. looks very much like it follows the broken stick model. In many ecosystems, exotic species can influence why certain species are common and others are rare. Exotics often can outcompete natives. And there are some rules that have been proposed for predicting which woody seed plants are likely to become invasive using Remenex and Richardson's Z-score, which they figure out from mean seed mass, how long the plants are juveniles, and how long it is between seed crops. Plants with the Z greater than zero are likely to be invasive, and those with larger seeds very likely to be invasive, especially those that have fleshy fruits that may be dispersed by birds, very likely invasive. Look at this last category, Z less than zero, non-invasive unless dispersed by water. And one example of a plant dispersed by water with small seeds is the purple loose drive, Lyth Lythrum salicaria, which was introduced in the northeastern um, U.S. and Canada for it grew slowly there for 20 or 30 years and then started to spread um, taking over wetlands as you can see from its spread by this key. Other things that help species invade are rapid dispersal, especially aided by animals or abiotic factors. Species that exhibit a lot of clonal growth that lets them outcompete natives. Those that can invade disturbed sites and maybe invading in open sites with empty niches, young site history. Here are two plots of native species richness on the x-axis versus exotic species richness on the left from central grassland areas, on the right from the Colorado Rockies, and you can see that some habitats fall below the line. Maybe these are habitats that are longer established, like the lodgepole pine, over here, or the mixed prairie. But in general, the other ones follow the line um, pretty well, maybe a little bit above. And perhaps those are those with empty niches or younger site history. Many species escape their native control agents when they move to a new area. Here we can see the various types of damage from different enemies on the x-axis and the percent of populations with damage in the native range, in this case these are for European plants, much higher than for those in North America where the species grow as exotics. So in cases like this, people often go to the area where the pest plants are native to seek native control agents and bring them to the new area as uh, biocontrol agents.
So you all already know very much that species diversity is much more than just the number of species present, that it matters how many are individuals are in all of the different species, evenness. But what makes some communities diverse and others not? Perhaps it's productivity. You might think that with more resources available, plants would grow very opulently and there would be much greater productivity. But what does this mean for hetero, for species diversity? And then some habitats have a lot of heterogeneity too, which may increase or decrease productivity. Here we can see maybe some evidence of what has been called the paradox of enrichment. With greater levels of fertilizer present, species richness, the graph on the left, increases to a certain point, but then decreases lower than either of the others. And if we look at the density of stems at the site as well, increasing a little bit, but then after a while, falling off. Indeed, you can see all kinds of patterns looking at the number of species and how that corresponds with productivity. Some habitats give what we might expect, more species, greater productivity, greater productivity, more species. But some at the upper right show decreasing, just the inverse. And then there are those that show decreasing on a curve, increasing and then decreasing in the lower right. So if we look at the distribution of these productivity diversity patterns among all different communities, mo the most studies of all show unimodal or one-directional relationships. 10% show U-shaped, 20% more or less show a positive relationship between productivity and diversity, and 10 or so a negative. And then there are quite a few, more than 20%, that show no correlation at all. So we can only conclude that it's impossible to generalize. Probably very important for diversity is that the fact that different species have different requirements and no species is the best competitor under all conditions. In the Sonoran Desert, for example, Places where cacti and long-lived shrubs survive are different than those areas where the annual ephemerals grow after a rain. So are diverse ecosystems the most productive? This is not only an ecological question, but a conservation issue as well. It seems like it should usually be a positive correlation, evidence from indigenous agriculture with intercropping showing better yields and survivals and quality of produce versus monocultures. But it is a controversial topic. We looked at the general patterns and found there was no one conclusion. And a number of experiments have been done with mixtures of species. Look at the vertical spread of the dots above each of these points, and you can see that Biomass does not necessarily equal productivity. Examples from a number of different countries found that with species, um, whoops, sorry, with species richness increasing to the left, biomass may increase depending on how you draw these lines. But there is a lot of variation. And if we just look at certain functional groups of plants, plant species, things that live and work in the same kinds of ways, the more species that are involved, the lower the biomass total tends to be. And then we always have to keep in mind the regional constraints on diversity as to what species are present, perhaps not only of plants, but of the animals interacting with them. The bigger the landmass size, the greater the diversity. Species diversity is lower on islands and on peninsulas. And here is a major herbivore on one of our nearby islands, Big Pine Key in the lower Florida Keys shaping the plant community by its patterns of herbivory.